now my pleasure to introduce the 2017 Eddington Lecture. It will be given by Catherine Johnston from Columbia University, and the title is, as you can see, Physical Manifestations of Evolution, Chaos and Regularity Around Our Galaxy. Catherine. Okay, great. Thanks uh, very much. Thanks very much for the invitation. I just had um, a couple of great days at Cambridge, and now it's really nice. This is my first visit to the physical location of the Royal Astronomical Society, and it's really great to be here. So physical manifestations of evolution, chaos, and regularity around our galaxy. It's going to be a completely different topic, in case you can't get that from the title, from the last two talks. The talk is about very low surface brightness features and structures that we found uh, in stars around uh, our galaxies. And it's been really enabled um, by um, star count surveys that contain um, catalogs of millions upon millions of stars uh, that have been put together in the last 15 to 20 years. So this is an example uh, of the sort of structure that have been seen. This was a visualization put together by the Cambridge group, uh, Vasily Belukharov, a 2013 version. What you're looking at here is actually a map of the sky as mapped by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. The brightness corresponds to the density of stars that you're looking at, and the color corresponds to distance, right? So this is a high-density region and a low-density region. And the way this map has been made is we've carefully put, uh, they've carefully not put any galaxies in the map at all. This is just stars around our own Milky Way. And also, because we have an idea of distances, we haven't mapped any nearby stars. So it's not the stars in the main disk of the Milky Way that you might be familiar with. These are the stars outside the main disk in what's called the halo, the stellar halo of the Milky Way, at uh, rather large distances from us. And what you're supposed to see here, the key point that I want you to take away is less the colors, more the point is this is very non-uniform. You can see large dark patches here and here. You can see streaks in this direction and this direction and this direction. And it's those streaks that I'm going to be talking about during my talk. <coughs> so here's another vis visualization of the same thing, um, uh, just uh, visualized by the Yale group up the road from me. Um, but um, again, what you can see is there's dark patches and light patches. So those light patches, the things that I'm going to concentrate in my talk, actually, um, uh, they contain very, very few stars in the grand scheme of things, right? The total amount of stars in the stellar <coughs> halo is about 1% of the total amount in the galaxy overall, right? So they may seem completely insignificant, and they are insignificant in terms of the star formation history of the universe. But actually, precisely because there's only very few stars there, it makes them very interesting to study. Um, because it means they can get flung around um, by uh, interactions of galaxies very easily. And moreover, structures like this that you see, these overdensities that are handily labeled in this plot, um, they, those structures can last for billions of years. And so we can look, this, look uh, use these structures uh, to understand signatures of interactions and histories of galaxies. And they're also very useful in another way. Their, their dynamics is extremely simple because their mass is uh, inconsequential. So it's simple, very test particle dynamics, which means we can understand it and interpret it well and learn about things like the global structure of the entire matter distribution of the Milky Way. Okay? Right, so despite these being a tiny fraction of the universe, they're very interesting, and there's, it's been a, a long-standing interest of mine uh, to talk about, um, to learn about these structures. So what I want to do in this talk um, is just concentrate on two recent areas um, of implications that I've just become aware of in the last five years or so, uh, which have grown out of uh, studying these. And in both cases, they're from coming from directions where it was more of a discovery to understand um, uh, the implications versus um, uh, a straight line path to get there. So in the first part of the talk, what I want to do is um, talk about um, this structure over here. In the, this is low galactic latitude. The disk of the Milky Way is around here. It's looking out from the center of the Milky Way towards what's called the anti-center. Uh, uh, so instead of towards the center, you're looking toward the anti-center from the sun. And you can see there appear to be some structures that are sort of parallel to the galactic plane here. 
But these structures are a very, very long way from the galactic disk. And it wasn't, I did not assume at the beginning of this study that they were associated with the disk. But I'm already giving you the end point of this part of the talk is we'll end up talking about the evolution of the galactic disk nevertheless and what these structures are going to tell you about that. Um, that's the first part of the talk. The second part of the talk, um, I want to concentrate more on these streams that I pointed out to you earlier. These are at what would, we would say higher galactic latitudes, so looking directly out of the galactic plane. Um, and this is just one example of Paloma 5 globular cluster stream. And the reason I've become, uh, well, I've been interested in these for a very long time, but a more recent interest of mine um, as to why they could be particularly interesting is I think that their structure is telling us something very fundamental about dynamics around the galaxy that ties um, uh, uh, back quite in an interesting way to the study of dynamical systems more generally and the question of when you might actually have a chaotic versus a re regular dynamical system. Okay, so we'll see how far we get on both of these things. Um, <clears throat> okay, so first of all, um, uh, let's think about this structure down here. Um, so this was originally um, discovered, um, this structure, uh, in a, around 2000, and it was given the name the monoceros ring, but I'll also refer to it as, as gas. So gas or the monoceros ring, it's uh, a ring of stars way beyond what's traditionally thought of as the edge of our galactic disk, and actually um, at very large distances or heights above and below the galactic disk. Um, and I want to talk not only about this structure, but some other structures that have been found subsequently. Um, so uh, this is looking at the same region of the sky. This is galactic longitude and galactic long latitude. So zero galactic latitude is where the galactic disk lies. And the anti-center that I've been talking about is at 180 degrees. So this would be back towards the galactic center, and this is out from the galactic center. And the gas um, uh, monoceros structure is in, mostly in the northern hemisphere here and a little below. But I want to talk about two other structures which have been found since then that sit even further from the galactic center and even further away from the galactic plane. And uh, they were discovered by, uh, in another star count map called, um, that was made uh, from the two micron all sky survey. And it was made using a type of stars called N giant stars. And if you look at M giant stars at distances further than gas and mon, you can see uh, a vast overdensity in star counts. And this is covering a very large uh, fraction of the sky, hundreds of square degrees. And these, this uh, overdensity is known as the triangulum Andromeda cloud. And in fact, in distance, we see this as two overdensities. So there are two clouds here, sort of concentric to each other. And when I say clouds, I just have to remind you, I say clouds, but these are clouds of stars, not clouds of gas. So these are made up of stars. Then there's another um, structure. Uh, uh, so this is an all-sky map again. The galactic plane would be here. And the other structure over density um, here is known as A13, a very romantic name, because it was the 13th structure that Sanjeev Sharma had found in this study. But again, it's an over density of star counts, again, beyond the edge of the galactic disk that's taking up a large region of the sky. So um, when I uh, started working on this, or my group started working on this, our plan was to, we knew in space where these were located, at least roughly. We knew the areas on the sky, and we knew the, the distance that they were a long way outside what we thought of as the main component of the galaxy. And so we wanted to get some more information about them in order to understand their origin. Um, and so we put together a team to start looking at what we thought were, um, we called at that point, halo structures. And what we decided to do um, was to try and map these halo structures. And our aim at the time, actually, was to uh, try and put them all into this model, where we, uh, which was uh, popular at the time, that these uh, rings of structures around the galaxy were actually an entire other galaxy that had been pulled apart. So a satellite galaxy that had been completely pulled apart. And this is a, a not terribly good image, from, from a, but to illustrate, this is from a, a paper by Jorge Penarubia, who's now up in Edinburgh. And the galactic center would be here. The main scale of the galaxy is out to 20 kiloparsecs here. And he's run a model of uh, the disruption of a satellite galaxy where he can spread stars in these beautiful rings all the way around the galaxy. 
And for a long time, that was the interpretation of what we thought these structures were, because they were so far out beyond the edge of the galactic disk and above and below the galactic plane. So the first aim of the survey that, uh, that I started carrying out, and uh, one of the people I was working with was Alison Sheffield, was to just understand this model better, to map these streams in various dimensions and try and constrain this model uh, better. So um, this is the whole program that we came up to map these various structures. Um, the first program was to look at velocities and the metallicities of the structures. Um, uh, and we've done this both for Triand 1 and Triand 2, and more recently, we've also done this for A13 now. The second thing we decided to do was to try and measure distances to these structures more accurately than we already knew them, because the distances we had to these stars was not very accurate. And in order to do that, we tried to find a special class of stars called R. Lyrae stars, where we are able to use them as very accurate distance indicators. And we wanted to measure the velocities of these stars and associate them with the structures and find distances to them. And then more recently, the, we've picked up two other uh, parts of this study, and they, they were to measure abundance patterns, so to measure the chemical compositions of these stars and test whether they looked more like halo stars or disk stars. And lastly, we also wanted to run some simulations, which I'll get to um, at the end. <clears throat> so if we start with this initial study, um, I'm going to report results from uh, both of these, um, the old one and the more recent one. Um, so um, to remind you, we're looking, if I combine the stars that we're going to look at, we're covering um, 140 degrees in longitude and 80 degrees in latitude, so a vast area of the sky. And we've got targets, these M giant stars, in the uh, Monoceros ring, also known as gas. And we've got targets in A13. And we've got targets also in the Triangulum 1 and Triangulum 2, um, uh, uh, Triangulum Andromeda, <laughs> Triangulum 1 and Triangulum 2 clouds. Um, and you can see this is telling you where on the sky these things lie. Um, and they cover a large distance. Now, if we, ha we have rough distances to these, um, uh, these stars, so I can actually project this onto the galactic plane to give you a sense of scale here. So this is a projection down onto the galactic plane. The galactic center would be here, and this is the sun, and we're looking out at these stars towards the galactic anti-center. And if you look at the scale here, uh, you can see that um, we're going out to distances of 20 kiloparsecs to um, even 30 kiloparsecs and beyond. And what's not quite apparent here, because the different colors denote the different features, denote the different features. Um, what's not quite apparent here is actually um, the distance errors on each of these points is very large. So it looks like they're, um, they're quite smooth in space. But actually, um, uh, one way you can see that they're not too smooth in space is by looking at a, what's called a color magnitude diagram. I'm not sure how many <laughs> astronomers there are here and how many of you are geophysicists. So um, I'm not going to explain this diagram in, in detail, but what you're supposed to see are the three sequences here that look quite distinct. Um, and those three sequences um, uh, correspond to tri the green points, the pink points, and the red points. And the fact that you see distinct sequences here is indicative that actually these are quite distinct. These look more like rings than is suggested in this plot here. That's the only point I'm trying to make. Okay. <clears throat> the other thing I wanted to give you a sense of is scale, because I keep on saying these are a long way out. So to give you a sense of scale here, here's a cartoon visualization of the galaxy with the sun in the appropriate place, an appropriate scale here. And you can see the main spiral arms here going out to about 20 kpc. And these are sitting well beyond what we think of as the edge of the galactic disk. And then if you look in the other dimension, so this is... This is the galactic plane, and now we're looking out of the galactic plane. You can also see the galactic disk um, uh, only goes up to uh, a kiloparsec or so above and below this plane, and these structures are well, well out of the galactic disk. Okay. Um, so um, the results from our survey, first of all, um, we can plot the line of sight uh, velocities of these stars as a function of galactic longitude. So this is looking around here as a function of galactic longitude. And um, what you're supposed to see in this plot are two things. One is that there's a general trend that's consistent across these groups, even though it, they're at different places. They follow the same general trend of velocity with galactic longitude. 
But the other thing to, uh, to see is that there's uh, some scatter, but not a huge scatter here. So what you expect for a galactic halo distribution would be a scatter of order 100 of kilometers per second, a random halo uh, population. And the fact that this scatter around this line is very much less than 100 kilometers per second is telling you that you're actually seeing stars that are associated with each other. These structures are real. In other words, they're not chance alignments of densities. So we believe these structures are real in velocity. Great. So we've got that the structures are real in velocity. And at this point, I actually published a paper with Alison Sheffield where uh, we again uh, made a nice model, at least of two of these structures, showing how you could get these by destroying uh, an infalling dwarf galaxy. I'm going to show you a model of that, of something similar to that later, later on. Um, but meanwhile, for this particular study, we went on, and as I said before, we tried to find distances uh, to the structures more carefully so we would be able to um, uh, make our models better. So these distances currently have error bars of about this size on them. Uh, so we did this um, by taking the velocity sequence for triand 1 and triand 2. So this is what I'm showing here. It's the same plot I just showed as a function of galactic longitude, the line of sight velocity. And you can clearly see this overdensity with a small dispersion uh, corresponding to triand 1 and triand 2. Um, and what we did at that point in a study led by Adrian Price Whalen, who was a graduate student at Columbia at the time, he uh, looked at, um, he went to find the velocities of these RLI stars. And the intention was we would find velocities of RLI stars that fell on the same sequence. And then we'd find the distances to those RLI stars, and that would tell us the, a better distance to the structure overall. But what we found when uh, Adrian got back from the telescope and Alison had done some reduction <coughs> was we actually found this. These are the velocities of the RLI stars that we measured. And what this meant, is, in essence, is we had a null result. We were unable to find a population of RLI stars that actually fits along the sequence um, that we were able to, we, we could see in the M giant stars. So at first we were a little disappointed and we thought, well, is it worthwhile publishing this null result? But very quickly we realized this actually, this was actually far more interesting than our original experiment. So I want to explain to you why, how, why this is interesting um, uh, in the context of the types of stars that we see around our galaxy. <clears throat> so, the Aurelari stars that we were studying um, are, uh, are, as I told you, a special type of stars. And it turns out that those stars can only be found in old and metal poor populations. Um, so you don't find young Aurelari stars or Aurelari stars in metal rich populations. On the other hand, uh, so the stars that uh, we could not find associated with the uh, MJ sequence come from old and metal poor, metal poor populations. On the other hand, M giant stars only occur in metal-rich populations. So what this means is if you have a, po a population of stars that's quite complex, that has old uh, metal-poor populations and metal-rich populations, you're going to find both R Lyrae's and M giant stars. On the other hand, if you have um, a metal, uh, type of galaxy, for instance, that is very old and only contains metal-poor populations, you're not going to find M giant stars. Um, and if you have a population that's relatively young and is, is currently forming stars, um, you're not going to find our Lyra's, you only find the M giant stars. So we can actually put this together into an argument as to what type of structure, um, um, uh, what, what was the origin of the structures that we're actually seeing. Um, and the way we did this was to, um, first of all, estimate um, from let me go backwards for a second. From this data, we estimated um, uh, what limits do we have on the fraction of our Lyra's that could possibly be part of the sequence, given the velocity data we had. So we did an analysis where we uh, modeled this as two population ones, one with a velocity gradient and a, a thin cold sequence, and the other with no sequence and a, and a large velocity dispersion. And we asked what fraction of our Lyra's could be in the sequence and what fraction of M giants could be in the sequence. And this is the answer to that question. So this is a probability distribution function for F, which is the number ratio of our Lyra to M giants in the sequence that we'd been studying. 
And you can see that this uh, peaks very convincingly at zero, although there is some spread going up to sort of 50% or so. So where this ties in to the rest of the galaxy, the argument goes something like this. First of all, you can think about the satellite galaxies of the Milky Way. Satellite galaxies of the Milky Way are much uh, smaller than the main uh, galaxy, uh, at least 100 and sometimes up to a million times smaller than the main galaxy, the Milky Way. Um, and what that means is they tend to contain, they tend to contain older stars, and they are uh, dominated by only metal poor populations. So actually, uh, in all but two of the satellite galaxies of the Milky Way, we have not find a, found a single M giant stars. So for satellite ga galaxies of the Milky Way, dwarf galaxies in other words, this number is typically infinity, right? So it's nowhere on this plot. The only two satellites of the Milky Way where, 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 where we have found any M giant stars are the Large Magellanic Cloud and Sag the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy. Oh, and, and I guess the Small Magellanic Cloud must also be, um, be in that set too. Um, so these galaxies are the largest dwarf galaxies that we see orbiting the Milky Way. And we, we've also found our alliers in these objects. And the reason is basically that these galaxies have more extended star formation histories. They have um, deeper potential wells. So they have both metal-rich and metal-poor populations. And the number ratios we measure for these of our alliers versus M giants is about 50%. So they sit here. So they're, they're <coughs> are mildly consistent with what we're me measuring in our data, but not very convincingly. On the other hand, you may, you're probably not surprised that this is the punchline. If we actually look at our galactic disk, our galactic disk is currently forming stars. It's the biggest galaxy in the galaxy. It's the most metal-rich population. <coughs> so the, there are far fewer RLIs in the disk relative to the M giants than in any of the other uh, populations that we've talked about. So this was actually um, convincing evidence for me that the populations that we were studying that we thought were part of the halo and that we thought came from satellites were actually far more likely to have formed in the galactic disk. And we, since then, we've also uh, looked at uh, other structures, namely the A13 structure, and we're finding a very similar result. So there's, um, I want to tell you um, one more thing about this result before um, uh, uh, finishing on uh, this part of the talk on why this is so very interesting, the broader implications. So in much more recent work, we started looking at uh, the chemical compositions of the, st of the stars as a final confirmation of the origin of these stars. So this is plotting uh, the sodium to iron ratio <coughs> versus uh, the iron to hydrogen or metallicity of the stars. And what you need to see here is, is patterns. Going back to our first speaker, you need to see patterns in this data and what you should see in the gray is the stars aren't completely everywhere, but you should see a sequence. The gray sequence uh, outlines where um, the abundance pattern for stellar halo stars and also for disk stars. So these are main st uh, stars in the main components of the Milky Way. These stars are stars from satellite galaxies, and you can see they don't sit in the same areas of this plot. And if I now add in the abundances that we've just measured recently, the yellow points are the abundances of stars in the A13 and triand 1 and triand 2 sequences. And the only point you're supposed to get from this is the yellow points are closer to this gray area, which are thick disk stars, um, uh, rather than the dwarf galaxies. So the implications basically for this, if I give you a summary of where we've got to, um, for these structures that we thought were part of the halo, we found this continuous velocity <coughs> sequence with a small dispersion, <coughs> We found no associated R and Lyrae stars, which you typically find in satellite galaxies of the Milky Way. We found an abundance pattern that looks like the disk of the Milky Way. And actually, this was from my friends in Cambridge. They've been working on this result soon. So uh, there's some um, additional evidence from a different direction from the Cambridge group that should be coming out soon on the motions in these structures. But the bottom line that I'm trying to convince you of that um, we think that there are stars, we've discovered stars that were born in the disk of our galaxy in regions where we don't think they should be um, and which are not traditionally thought of as part of the galactic disk. They're at far greater galactocentric radii and far greater um, uh, distances above and below the plane of the galaxy. And of course, the really interesting part of this, at least from my perspective, um, it's, it's fun to discover these things, but the question is what's going on that puts the stars there? 
Um, and this gets back to the starting point. Uh, it's been studied for a long, the uh, interactions of satellites with the disk of the Milky Way and the effect of satellite galaxies on the disk of the Milky Way has been studied for a long time. And part of the reason that people like to study that effect is that um, uh, galactic disks uh, typically can have uh, multiple components. You can have very thin galactic disks, but you can also have disks that are sl have slightly high, a larger scale height and um, are thicker. And um, uh, the history of this area is that people have for a long time, for 20 years, been running simulations of satellites heating disks to understand this process of di uh, disk thickening. But what they've typically looked at is the average properties at the end point of their simulations of the thick disks compared to the thin disks. And the exciting thing um, um, that I think we're starting to see in the Milky Way is rather than studying the end point of that process, we'd be, we're going to be able to study the very middle point of that process. Because I think what we're seeing in these overdense rings around the edge of the galaxy that are being thrown out is the process of disk heating in action. And this is just one simulation uh, run by Shervin Laporte, who's a postdoc at Columbia, um, to illustrate that idea. So, and it's following on from a long history of satellite disk interaction simulations. So this is the end point of a simulation of a galactic disk that he's thrown a satellite at. And you're looking on the left at over densities, which you can see are, come out in the form of these rings, uh, propagating out from the center of the galaxy. And this is showing you the height above and below the disk plane that these over densities are, are reaching, uh, which is going to uh, plus and minus four kiloparsecs. So this was one of his early simulations with just uh, a single satellite of the Milky Way. And in later simulations, we're able to reach even the heights that we saw in the, what we now think of as disk debris in the structures that we found. Um, and the fun thing is that this picture is just growing of, of these um, uh, disturbances to the galactic disk. Um, so what I discussed to you was this model of these density structures in the outer part of the galactic disk. This cartoon is supposed to represent, here's the galactic center, here's the sun, this is the galactic plane. And it's a cartoon of what we've seen. It's not, it's not correct in any sense, but just to, as a cartoon. We're looking out from the galactic center, and we're seeing over densities at, at, uh, in a sequence of different distances um, uh, as we go out at increasing heights above and below the galactic plane. And we're interpreting this as a wave going out through um, the uh, disk, a sort of radial wave going out. So we've seen this in density, and we've seen, we've seen the association in stellar populations, uh, but another fun result that's come out in the last couple of years is actually locally around the sun. If you measure the velocities of stars very carefully, uh, there are new results which are showing that we think the disk is actually breathing. So it's not just sitting there with the disk stars on average going up and down with a mean, a no mean change. We actually see uh, indications that the uh, local disk is actually breathing slightly. And that would be consistent with the signature of a wave going out. So we can actually tie in these over densities on large scales outside the galaxy to motions around the sun. And I think this picture is somewhat hand wavy at this point and cartoonish, but I think in the long run, we're going to be able to really build a very careful picture of disk heating in action. Um, and the other half of disk heating in action is actually how do we form the, our own stellar halo with the Milky Way, those stars that we see at large distances. There are many ways, um, uh, several avenues to this, but disk heating has always been proposed as one of those avenues for making uh, moving disk, for, uh, disk stars into the stellar halo and as a formation mechanism, at least in part, of the stellar halo. So this is uh, why I find this result um, uh, particularly interesting. Okay, great. So that was the uh, first part of what I uh, wanted to talk about, and I want to give you um, an overview um, uh, on the second uh, problem to give you an idea um, of another rather distinct area that uh, my group has been looking at. Um, so in the first part, we talked about these structures that were close to the galactic disk. Now we're going to specifically talk about structures that really are out beyond the disk of the galaxy in the stellar halo. And um, uh, Palomar 5 is uh, just one example of a structure like this. So these structures that you see as thin streams here we really do think these are the remnants of uh, destroyed dwarf galaxies. And here's an old, old simulation to show an example of a dwarf galaxy being destroyed by the Milky Way. 
So in this case, instead of thinking about how a satellite attacks the Milky Way, we think about how the Milky Way cannibalizes a satellite. And what such simulations show is if you start off with a spherical ball of matter and you uh, let it evolve in the potential field of the Milky Way, of course the satellite's orbiting, but it's also being attacked by the tidal forces of the Milky Way, and that can literally pull stars off from the satellite and spread, um, and um, those unbound stars, the, the ex really exciting part of this is the unbound stars don't wander randomly off into space. They actually form these beautiful streams which can ma maintain coherent, coherence for many gig years. And it, it's these streams that you're seeing in the images I've been showing you. These are streams. This is a, a dead uh, satellite galaxy. This is a dead satellite galaxy. This is a stream from a satellite galaxy that we see, Sagittarius. And this is a stream from a little cluster of stars no, known as the Palomar 5 globular cluster. So it's not strictly a satellite galaxy, but the physics is the same. And you can, you can see these overdensities were beautifully first um, plotted by Odenkirking using data from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Um, so the physics behind um, what's causing this disruption is pretty well understood, and it's fairly easy to model. As I told you, um, uh, once um, uh, these, these uh, stars are inconsequential in the mass budget of the galaxy, so that one means that once you've released the stars from the Lagrange points um, of uh, this globular cluster, these stars are essentially following test particle orbits. So all you need to do is integrate the orbits in a fixed potential to represent the Milky Way. And that what that means is there's a huge amount of information in here about the history of this object itself, but also about the potential of the Milky Way. And that's where this gets really interesting. So these tiny objects can tell you a lot of information about the uh, full mass distribution in the Milky Way. So Palomar 5 has been studied a lot in particular because it's relatively close um, and uh, you can get a lot of data and information about it. So here's one such study which was led by Sarah Pearson who is a graduate student in my group at Columbia. And what you'll see on the left side, um, in the blue, are, is the same star count map that I just showed you. So it's contours of the same star count map I just showed you, the observations. And in the red is a model that Sarah successfully ran to model um, um, the uh, overdensity that you see uh, in um, stars. And she ran this in a model of the galaxy that contained a disk component to represent the disk of stars, and then a dark matter halo component, um, which uh, um, was uh, mostly uh, uh, nearly spherical. So what that meant, the combined potential was basically a fairly simple oblate potential, so a squashed sphere. Um, and that was the force field that these stars were experiencing. And what she found was in, in this case, it was really easy to find a model that fit the data very well in these and other dimensions. So where this study got interesting was when we tried to run models in um, a more complicated potential, so a traxial potential, so one in which the halo of the Milky Way was squashed in two dimensions instead of one dimension. And this, I should say that this um, traxial potential model was, was motivated by other data from um, another star stream. And so it had been, uh, uh, it had been proposed as a, a reasonable fit for the Milky Way. And the interesting we found, thing we found was when we tried to model Palomar 5 in this data, in this, sorry, in this potential, you can see uh, this is a general uh, example of what we found. We found we could produce thin streams only for a short st stretch of the orbit. And that in this particular potential model, which is a very specific potential model, we can never get long thin streams. Instead, we got what Sarah dubbed stream fanning. And this doesn't seem... Um, uh, necessarily terribly interesting itself, it's only ruling out one potential model, so we, we should try some more to fit all the data, sure. Um, but it's interesting in two ways. One is that, um, uh, is that this is a very cheap way, observationally, to rule out a potential model, because this is relying on just star count data alone. It's not actually relying on velocities or anything else very deep or expensive to get at a telescope. Uh, so this is a very powerful way of measuring the potential if we can generalize this. Um, the second reason is interesting, goes back to the same question that I asked at the end of the last section, which is why. And actually, this is where I think this story gets really interesting, is 
why is it in this particular potential model you cannot get thin streams? So the immediate and obvious answer to that question um, um, is that as you get more and more pot uh, complicated potentials, you're more likely to find chaotic orbits. Um, but um, the reason um, uh, why it's particularly intriguing that this um, might be a signature of chaos is that in precisely in, in this type of potential, which was not terribly complicated, but also in this region of the galaxy, you wouldn't expect chaos to be important. Uh, first of all, the potential is, is fairly simple. Secondly, you're looking at uh, fairly soft regions of the potential without steep radial gradients. Both of those um, uh, would uh, help soften the, um, soften the effect of chaos. Um, and the final one is that the uh, number of times that Palomar 5 has gone around the galaxy is actually very small in the grand scheme of things. It's of order tens of times, say 30 or 40 times. And what that means is that this is a dynamically young system. And um, uh, to have chaos, an effect of chaos manifesting itself on time scales of tens of dynamical times is just um, intuitively not, it's not what you expect. So we actually started investigating this from um, a dynamical perspective to try and understand um, whether we're really seeing chaos, and if so, why would we be seeing the effect of chaos in a regime where precisely where we don't expect to find it? <clears throat> so before we go there, I just want to uh, get us on the same page so we're talking about chaos and regularity in the same way. So um, regular orbits um, um, uh, 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 can be characterized by some fixed orbital properties in general. So in a, in a beautiful spherical potential, you would say, angular momenta are conserved, and those would be the orbital properties um, that are conserved. In more complicated potentials, it's not necessarily the angular momenta, and it might be um, uh, conserved properties called the actions. But nevertheless, you have conserved <coughs> orbital properties. And this basically means that you can't randomly wander through space along these orbits. You have a predictable orbital path. And in particular, what I'm going to talk about um, are the frequencies of these orbits. If you integrate a regular orbit and it's in whatever potential, and then you choose one of the coordinates, x, y, z, or vx, or vy, or vz, and you take a Fourier transform of that time sequence, in a regular orbit, you'll end up with some very clear peaks in your Fourier transform, corresponding to linear combinations of just three fundamental frequencies. So your Fourier transform will basically tell you there are three fundamental frequencies to this predictable path, and they're very clear. And the second thing to say is that if you integrated the orbit again over a different part of the orbital path, you would get the same answer, right? So regular orbits are predictable, and they have fixed properties that you can measure from any part of the orbit. Chaotic orbits, on the other hand, are the opposite of that, right? They, they don't have properties that you're able to measure as conserved for any um, length of, any uh, significant length of time. And this means that their path is unpredictable. And if you take a Fourier transform of any one dimension of their orbit, you'll end up finding a, a, a much more complicated Fourier transform with peaks that are harder to see. And if you can pick them out, you'll find that the frequencies you find in one stretch of the orbit are not the same as the frequencies you find in another stretch. In other words, the frequencies drift with time. So what I'm going to talk about here is um, uh, to characterize chaos is to pick up on this idea of frequency drift. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> uh, so I want to concentrate on this second measure of chaos, the frequency drift. So a, a classic way of characterizing chaos along orbits is indeed just to do what I just described, to measure the frequencies in one part of the orbit and the frequencies in the other. And the frequency drift time is the time for those frequencies to change by of order unity, right? So we're going to use that as our way of characterizing uh, uh, frequency drift. To go back to the example that I started from, right, we were indeed correct in our intuition that you would not expect chaos to be important for the simulation we ran. When we calculated the frequency drift time for the orbit of Palomar 5 in our simulations, we found that that frequency drift time was very much longer than the age of the universe or the Hubble time. In fact, not just, you know, not just three or four times, I'm talking hundreds of times longer than the age of the universe. So that means that according to the frequency drift time, we should not be 
seeing chaos along this orbit at all. <clears throat> so what we did to, to under, try and understand this is we did a systematic experiment in an arbitrary potential, a triaxial potential, that contained um, both regular orbits and chaotic orbits. And um, uh, this, was, this part of the study was led by Adrian Price Whalen again. And what Adrian did was choose four orbits that actually had very similar characteristics. They had similar pericenters and apocenters, similar time scales. They were in similar regions of the galaxy. But he chose ones that were strictly regular according to the frequency drift times. He could calculate these frequencies very well. And he also chose a couple that were chaotic. One which was weakly chaotic, it had a frequency drift time of 10 to the 5 giga years. So in other words, 10,000 times the age of the universe. <coughs> and another one which had a frequency drift time of 100 giga years, which is 10 times the age of the universe, roughly. Right? And then for these four orbits, he ran a simulation of a disrupting cluster of stars. And this is what he found. He found on the regular orbits, you get beautiful thin streams. These are projections in different um, uh, uh, different planes, um, I, but you can basically see that you get uh, beautiful thin streams along the regular orbits, as you might expect, because uh, the orbital properties are not changing. But even the reduction of weak chaos, you can see, um, in a time scale, this was uh, 20 giga years is how long he ran the simulation for, which I admit is a little un unrealistic. Um, but nevertheless, uh, 20 giga years is far less than 10 to the 5 giga years, right? I hope you agree with that point. Um, so, and you can see, nevertheless, that you see some manifestations even of this very weak chaos in this finite amount of time, which, in which case, intuitively, would not have expected to see at all. And when you get to strong chaos, you see uh, uh, a much um, uh, stronger uh, manifestation of the chaos. <clears throat> so there's several exciting implications. The one I want to start with, though, um, um, well, I want to end with the observational implications, but before we get there, um, I want to um, uh, just discuss a, l a little bit about why you can see this in space when in the frequency drift time you don't expect to see chaos on these, uh, on these time scales. And to do that, we're going to, um, uh, I want to show you the frequency distributions themselves for those same simulations. So these are the exact same simulations, and we're now plotting um, the offsets and frequencies from the parent satellites for the regular orbits and for the weakly chaotic and strongly chaotic orbits. So these distributions are exactly what we expect for a small cluster of stars distributing, uh, uh, be, uh, disrupting along an orbit. We expect to see for that small cluster uh, at most 1% differences in frequencies. It's the frequency dis differences that cause them to uh, lengthen. So these are consistent with our expectations. Once you start seeing weak chaos and then strong chaos, what you start seeing is over the course of the simulations, those frequency distributions have spread out because the frequencies are not conserved. So this is not necessarily a huge surprise, um, but this again is happening at a 1% level to a system where the frequency drift time was 10,000 times longer than the period of the simulation. That is a surprise, right? So if we think of this in terms of our understanding of chaos, um, I, I'm going to uh, now take one of these panels and blow up a cartoon of a full map of an energy surface, of the frequencies of orbits in an energy surface in a, paper, uh, in a potential. And this is a technique called frequency mapping. And I'm just going to show a cartoon to get the idea across. So if you map the properties of frequency properties of orbits in a potential, um, uh, which all have the same energy, but some are radial and some are, some are more circular, um, you can actually plot those frequencies against each other as a sense of how these orbits are going to behave. And if you're um, in an exactly um, uh, integral potential, that means one in which all the orbits are regular, then if you plot the frequencies of an orbit at any one time, it'll appear as a point, right? So each point here corresponds to an orbit. And if you plot it at any time later, it's going to appear at the same point because the uh, frequencies don't change, right, for regular orbits. There are special locations, even in uh, an exactly integral uh, uh, potential, and these are known as the resonance lines. They're places where the uh, frequencies are integral multiples of each other, which means the orbits will close in on, the, on, the, uh, on themselves and repeat. And th so they have special properties. Now, if you start taking this potential, it might be a mildly triaxial potential, 
And maybe you start squashing it more, and you make it more and more uh, triaxial. What you find in this frequency map is different structures start appearing. Um, some of the orbits remain regular and fixed in space, and the resonant orbits remain fixed. Um, uh, so these resonant line remains. Um, but if you, if you have a, an orbit that's close to a resonance, uh, it tends to oscillate around the resonance just a little bit, and it's fairly regular. But once you move between these completely regular regions and the resonant lines, you get these stochastic layers. And these are regions where the frequencies start drifting by a large amount. Uh, uh, along the Sepratrix, um, uh, uh stochastic layer, um, along, sorry, along the stochastic layer, uh, the drifts don't tend to be too huge. But where you get regions where um, uh, resonances overlap, you get, get to regions of, of uh, strong chaos. The basic idea is, in the stochastic layers, the frequencies are still confined to a relatively small area. But once you move to uh, overlapping resonances, um, then you've got a large area where the frequencies can drift over. So in other words, the orbits that we just looked at corresponded to orbits, uh, orbits that were regular and the strong and weak chaos corresponded to these regions in the potential. Right? So what we think is going on um, when we're measuring frequency drift is something like this. For our weakly chaotic <coughs> orbit, what we think is the frequencies are oscillating back and forth here, not in a regular way at all, but they're exploring <coughs> almost in a random walk. They're exploring this resonance layer. So what that actually means is you get large excursions within that stochastic layer but at the same time, if you were to measure on average, you would get a low mean drift rate. It's sort of like a random walk. So I think that's what we think that's what we're seeing when we see the physical manifestation of chaos over a time scale where we're not expecting it. We're seeing the excursions in frequencies around the mean drift rate. That's our interpretation. So this is really fun. This has been a really fun project for me because it's taken me back to roots um, of learning about dynamics as an undergraduate and graduate student. Um, Nonlinear dynamics. It's not something I've really studied since then, so it's been a lot of fun to pick it up again. Um, but I also feel like um, there were a couple of really exciting implications. I'll try and get um, them across to, to you. The first one being observational. This is tremendously ex exciting. I remember as an undergraduate and graduate student learning about nonlinear dynamics for the first time and making Poincaré carry maps where you can map um, orbits in a system, and from the patterns you see in the uh, orbit space, you can identify regular regions and stochastic regions of orbit space. And this was a really fun mathematical, purely theoretical exercise. What I f feel that we've st stumbled along upon here is something different, uh, or something very related, but um, actually with a very practical application, a practical to an astronomer anyway, so that is, if we now look at this map that I showed you at the beginning, and we see these thin streaks here, uh, from what we've learned about the nature of orbits and how uh, that nature manifests itself, I would now say I can point to the GD1 stream and say, this must be a regular <coughs> orbit around the galaxy. To the Palomar 5 stream, I, I can say that must be a regular orbit around the galaxy. If these orbits were not regular, we wouldn't get these long thing streams. The same with the Orphan stream here. And they have to be regular to quite a strong degree. They can't even be mildly chaotic, because otherwise we, we would be seeing the manifestation of that chaos in the streams either disappearing or fanning out, right? So this, to me, this is very exciting. I feel like I'm, this is a Poincaré map of our galaxy, and it's actually just in the density structures of stars around our galaxy. And this is a, a very strong connection between pretty fundamental but also abstract dynamics and an observable system. So that's one reason I'm really excited. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm going to skip over the next few slides. I, there's a couple more examples. If you have any energy left after three long talks, you can ask me about it at the end. But I do want to talk about uh, a couple of other applications, uh, a couple of other implications. So I'm going to skip over this. It's tremendously exciting, but I'm going to skip over it. Um, um, and this is the um, other reason that I'm um, uh, intrigued by this idea. Right, I've all, already told you, I think the most exciting thing is we're observing, observing the nature of orbits around our own galaxy. But the other thing I, I, I feel, and um, if there are dynamicists in the audience who work on different systems, um, please correct me if I'm wrong, 
But from my understanding of the sorts of um, systems where we typically talk about chaos, we typically talk about chaos in um, a very uh, many dynamical times. Say the solar system, you're talking about uh, billions of orbits and you're looking at the effect of chaos over uh, many, many dynamical times. So uh, the system that we're looking at, in contrast, we're looking at the appearance of and signatures of chaos in just tens of dynamical times. So I think it's interesting in that way. Uh, another thing is, uh, my understanding is typically when you're talking about the effects of chaos, you often phase average your results. Um, so in other words, you look on average over time, over many orbits, but over, uh, over many types of orbits and over many orbital phases. And we're specifically looking at single orbits and we're looking at, um, by definition, we're looking at a small range of phases of single orbits. And again, we're finding signatures of chaos. Um, uh, also in astronomy, where um, to galaxies, where I've seen discussions of chaos before, you're typically applying this to, um, uh, one application could be, uh, what sort of structures can be self-consistently supported? In other words, their mass distribution generates the orbits that make the star structures that you observe. And in what types of structures can that work? And this has been particularly applied to uh, galactic centers in particular. So, um, and so those are bound structures. So another thing about um, what we've been looking at is applying these same sort of ideas, the same idea of can you support a structure with orbits, but instead of applying it to bound structures, applying it to unbound structures that are dispersing. How long that, can that structure be supported by orbits that are or are not chaotic? Um, so this, is, this was my overall uh, take home point are these two points in the first half of the talk um, that um, um, uh, I hope to have convinced you that we found parts of the disk where we didn't expect them and that has very interesting implications for processes that um, have been studied on average but we think we can now study in great detail. And the second half of the talk is trying to make a connection between some pretty fundamental dynamics and some observations around the edge of our galaxy. And the very last thought I want to leave you with is that I, I talked about the Milky Way, just the Milky Way, it's just one galaxy. There's 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe. Um, um, so why do we care about this? And I, um, of course we care about the Milky Way because it's the Milky Way, at least I do. But um, also um, we care about this because if we understand, uh, because if we understand uh, these um, two things um, for the Milky Way, we can apply them to other galaxies. And while the Milky Way is the galaxy that we have surveyed to the lowest surface brightness possible by mapping it very carefully in star counts, we're doing similar things with the Andromeda galaxy now. But looking ahead, there are, uh, I'm just mentioning two of them, but there are multiple avenues where we expect to be able to map other galaxies to much lower surface brightness than we can currently. So one in the States is a large synoptic survey telescope. Uh, and that, um, in the end, we're hoping to have samples of millions of galaxies. We're talking about 10, 20 years down the road, but we're hoping to have samples of millions of galaxies surveyed to uh, very low surface brightness here. Uh, another example is the W first satellite, um, uh, which should be uh, launching in the early 2020s. So this is a Hubble Space Telescope in the infrared. Um, and we should be able to use this to uh, do star count maps similar to the ones we've made of the Milky Way around galaxies out to 10 megaparsecs. So that's about 100 galaxies like the Milky Way now surveyed to a similar very low surface brightness. So I think, uh, I, hope I've, um, I hope you found something interesting in the talk and I'm trying to convince you that there's more interest in the future in both of these topics. So thanks very much. So thank you very much indeed, Catherine. Uh, so we now have uh, some minutes for comments and questions. So two over here. I should come here. I should, I should come here to ask. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very nice talk. Um, according to the standard cold dark matter model, the halo is full of lumpy dark things, you know, the so-called missing satellites. So these thin streams are surely uh, a very valuable probe and testing whether the universe, whether the halo of the Milky Way is lumpy. So what are the prospects for using these streams as very fine-grained tests of the distribution of matter in the halo? 
Right, so I planted that question, so now I'm going to start another hour-long talk. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so uh, yes, as, as I'm sure you know, the, uh, I think the prospects for that are very good. Um, but of course, I, in my talk, I'm pointing out yet more things that can affect this. So I think the, the trick, the work that really needs to be done, I mean, I've had a lot of fun thinking about such things for a long time. The work that really needs to be done now is to understand how to disentangle these effects. Um, and um, I didn't really get to mention this in, in the talk, but I, uh, my sense is that um, what we really want to do, Palomar 5 was, was seen as um, the, the uh, global cluster stream that I talked about here, was seen as the poster ch child for this. And indeed, there's been a couple of analyses recently um, with uh, uh, hopeful signs that um, uh, you may be able to use this to detect dark matter structures. Unfortunately, part of the talk I didn't get to was a, another effect that could cause similar signatures. So where I am with my thinking now on this is I think we want to find similar streams but at larger distances from the galactic center. Um, and I, th I think I th I'm still very hopeful that this is the way we're going to find those dark matter structures. Yeah. Yes, I was uh, you know, struck by the lack of any mention of the existence of the Gaia mission. <laughs> which I would have thought would be at least of uh, you know, marginal interest to your studies. Uh, you didn't give us any mention. No, I'm really sorry. Gaia is fantastic. I'm, I'm sorry. It was not being fantastic or not. <laughs> but not. For example, I, you mentioned that uh, about the, the, you know, those end dwarfs, uh, uh, that you, are, you know, mentioned distances. I assume, you didn't specify, but I assume you're talking about photometric distances. Yes, exactly. So not really distances. Exactly. Now, you didn't give us any magnitudes, but if, you know, fleetingly I pick it up... Um, minus two absolute magnitude, which you know, roughly brings us to between 10 and 15 in the region uh, you're talking to, where Gaia should give you 10% uh, actually geometric distance as part yes. of access. So yes. I would have thought that this would be of some interest to this field of study. So I would be a bit surprised from the lack of mention of Gaia. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm really sorry. <laughs> I've offended the entire side of this side of the Atlantic. And that was, that was a, you're completely right. I'm glad you mentioned Gaia. And it was a complete mass on my side. It's American mass. But um, on that note, I would say, no, I would say the, um, the distances to the M giants, I have been pointing out to my colleagues um, uh, 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 in anticipation of the next generation, the next data release. It might be the one after, because the current data, data release doesn't go that faint. So we've already, um, uh, so I've already been, the uh, Sergei Karpasov and company are, are already, um, that was the result that um, you should ask them about. And they are trying to use um, the current data release with SCSS to map the nearby features. But they, it doesn't actually um, go faint enough, um, the current data release. But indeed, a lot of these questions will become really interesting. So that's what Guy was built for? Yeah, no, yes, yes. <laughs> it's a very good point, I completely agree. Hi, thanks for a great talk. Uh, I have a question uh, along the lines of the, of the first one, which is, uh, if my memory is right, and correct me if I'm wrong, you know, dark halos in cosmological simulations have a range of shapes, but are on average prolate. Actually, so the question is, you know, you, you, you showed the discrepancy between your oblate potential model and the triaxial one, but have you checked what should be the most common, you know, shape, which is a prolate one? And if yes or no, you know, is, is the Milky Way special in any way, or the simulations wrong? Hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a great question, and that's, um, that's another talk um, um, to give, which would be on measuring potentials. And indeed, the hope is, with Gaia um, uh, and other uh, uh, measurements, that we will measure the shape of the halo as a function of uh, galactocentric distance. And in fact, the Gaia proper motions for that problem are absolutely essential in order to get to large... Di I'm going to mention Gaia every se second sentence now. <laughs> but the, uh, to, to measure proper motions at large distances, it's actually less the distance, because if we want to do this experiment, I'm really excited about this experiment, but we want to go a, a really long way out where we don't have the galactic disk to do the problem, right? So I'm actually hopeful if we get um, uh, uh, accurate distances from distance indicators, fantastic proper motions from Gaia, that we will measure the potential out to the virial radius. And traxiality, as you say, and orientation, 
and changes in orientation as a function of radius. But we also have to then separate out the effects of sublumps and chaos. So, you know. Um, you talk about chaos as if it was a thing in itself, whereas um, to most of us, the general shape of the galaxy looks statistically um, very highly determined with um, a smooth move, um, as you move out from the center, a smooth distribution of stars. Surely there is a determining factor in this, that in terms of the orbital speeds of stars about one another, this should match the orbital speed of them around the center of the galaxy, and this is quite a strong determining feature. I mean, as soon as you look at um, the Sun and Alpha Centauri, you can see that the match is pretty close. And um, broadly, there is a standard distance between stars. And surely, this is a determining thing, not something accidental, <coughs> not the action of some mysterious thing called chaos. It's a second way of organizing the way in which a big lot of stars come together. Yeah, so, so when I was talking about chaos, I, I was really talking about uh, the, the presence of chaotic orbits within this more global, well-determined structure. So you can have um, uh, 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 global structures that, are st that still contain some chaotic orbits. Um, so, so what I would, um, and sorry, but the, the, uh, the interplay between the two is that the global structure itself determines the natures of the orbits. So even if, you only, even if there are only a few chaotic orbits, if you're able to locate those chaotic orbits, it actually says something about the global structure. So it's not that the structure itself is chaotic, it's that um, there ca it can contain chaotic orbits within it. Does that, does that make, does that, I think we're talking a bit cross purposes, right? Yeah. <clears throat>